Income tax 2023-2024, residential rental property, rental income and expenses if no personal use of dwelling tax software example. Get ready and some coffee because tax preparation is like a choose your own adventure novel. Every choice leading to more pages of paperwork. Here we are in our f first, a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our CPA six-pack shirts, a must-have for any pool or beach time. Mixing money with muscle, always sure to attract attention. Yeah, even if you're not a CPA, you need this shirt. So you can like pull in that iconic CPA six pack stomach muscle vibe, man. You know, that CPA six pack everyone envisions in their mind when they think CPA. Yeah, as a CPA, I actually and unusually don't have tremendous abs. However, I was blessed with a whole lot of belly hair. Yeah, allowing me to sculpt the hair into a nice CPA six pack like shape which is highly attractive. Yeah, may maybe the shirt will help you generate some belly hair too. And if it does, make sure to let me know. Maybe I'll try wearing it on my head. A and yes, I know six pack isn't spelled right, but three letters is more efficient than four. So I trimmed it down a bit, okay? It's an improvement. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Form 1040 example problem using Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to software, it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Standard starting point, Adam Taxman. Just trying to avoid a dang tax, man. Living in Beverly Hills 90210. We've got single filer, no dependents to start off with. We're going to start with W-2 income. Compare and contrast that to the Schedule E rental property and to the Schedule C sole proprietorship. Starting W-2 income, though, 100000 We then have the standard deduction for the single filer that we can see on the left, the 13850 13850 getting to the taxable income. 86150, which we can mirror in our income tax formula in Excel, 100,000, 13,850, the taxable income, 86,150, going to the tax calculation, 14,266, which is on page two of the form 1040, calculated by the software. There's the 14,266. This is our baseline example with the W-2 income. So again, we want to contrast that to what would happen if we had a similar income in rental property on the Schedule E, contrasting that to if we had some other type of business like a sole proprietorship service business with similar income on a Schedule C. And that hopefully will give us an idea, a picture of the different types of incomes and some of the things we need to keep in mind as we have these different types of income clearly in practice usually if you have a schedule e for example you might also have w-2 income and you might also have a schedule c situation but we want to dissect them look at them one at a time look at the impacts of each of those types of incomes and how they differ from uh, each other so if i go back to the first tab this is kind of like our baseline scenario with the w-2 income Comparing the W-2 income to something like a Schedule C can be difficult because of the payroll taxes, the Social Security and Medicare being contrasted to the self-employment taxes. So if I go to the data input, for example, you can see when I enter the W-2, even if I don't put any federal income tax withholding, which is obviously part of the federal income taxes, which would show on the second page of the Form 1040 as a payment, we still have other items that are populating automatically by the software which are being based on the income that we have put in place that's going to be the social security in this case 6.2 percent is the general social security rate until you get over a certain threshold 
in, in which case you don't have any more social security over that threshold. So for example, it's taking the 100,000 times 0 0.062. And then we also have the Medicare, which is once again, somewhat of a flat tax. These two boxes, these two income amounts for social security and Medicare might differ from box one income for federal income tax purposes. But for our calculations right now, we just want to point out the 100,000 times the 0 0.0145. That's going to be where it got the 1,450. We want to understand that although these numbers aren't really affecting our income taxes with W-2 income, they are still taxes that are being paid and are just being reflected on the W-2. All of the information has basically been taken care of by the employer, the W-2 acting just like as a reporting mechanism to the IRS to kind of show that think that everything has been paid, which is similar to what the 1040 would do, except that the federal income taxes are way too complex to, to actually work that way, which is why we have to kind of shoot for the refund and so that we can avoid penalties and interest. Now, the reason that's a little bit confusing when we compare to like, like a Schedule C or a Schedule E is that when we go to a Schedule C, for example, this would be the sole proprietor business, we don't have uh, anybody withholding the Social Security and Medicare. So it makes sense then that we're gonna have net income for federal income tax purposes that will pull through and we apply the federal income taxes in a similar way. If we had 100,000 federal income taxes, they pull through, we pay taxes on that. But we also have to consider what happens with the Social Security and Medicare and how can we compare and contrast that to say W-2 income. Now, the other thing that could happen with a Schedule C is we might end up with a loss, which is something that you can't typically have happen with the with the uh, W-2, which is only gonna be income, right? You're not gonna have a negative W-2 wages. Can you take the losses? Noting the IRS is always gonna be skeptical of the losses. Now, if we have rental property, if it was an actual business, maybe then it would be here on the Schedule C, but more likely it's gonna be on the Schedule E, which is similar to the Schedule C in that it has an income statement format. But some of the questions that come up with the Schedule E, how is it different then? Well, one, do we still have to play the self-employment tax? If it was an active business where we're doing service work like we do in the Schedule C, you would expect that we would have to pay self-employment tax and that's why it would be reported on the Schedule C because it's subject, it's, it's gonna be subject to self-employment typically. Typically, if it's on the Schedule E, there's kind of a passive component to it possibly. And that is kind of like part of the argument possibly not to have it subject to the self-employment. So we might not be subject to Social Security and Medicare here, which is huge. And that would be a big, a big benefit, right? So then the question that we'll talk about in future presentations is where's the proper place to report this on the Schedule C and then the Schedule E. One of the downsides of the Schedule E is that if it's passive income in nature, then is it subject to passive activity rules and possibly at risk rules, which would limit the amount of losses. Noting that many times when people have rental property, a second home that they use for rental property, for example, then they, they, they might be taking losses on the rental property and be happy to do so because they might be able to take those losses against the other income, their W-2 income, and the property itself is acting as a hedge against inflation and whatnot, and hopefully will go up in value just due to the scarcity of the land without them having to really do anything, right? It's kind of passive in that case, and the IRS is skeptical of passive type of income, and therefore they might put rules to limit the amount of losses. So those are some of just an overview of some of the differences. So let's take a look at, at some of those. Let's go first to like a Schedule C, just to get an, a quick outline of what this looks like. What's the difference if I said no W-2 income, delete the W-2 income, and instead <clears throat> I go over here and say, we have Schedule C business, just to look at the differences. 100, I'll say 120,000, and then 120,000, one zero difference, who cares? What's the difference? And then we've got 20,000 down here just one measly zero. And then we're gonna go out to the forms and check it out. 
So now we've got the Schedule C. So the Schedule C has uh, 120,000 of income and then expenses. The expenses are basically deductions, even though they're on a separate form. We're using those in order to generate income. They're natural deductions that you would expect in an income tax type of system. It results in net income. That net income is flowing through. Let's close this up to the Schedule 1, which is the additional income and adjustments from the Schedule C. There's the 100,000, and then it flows through to the Form 1040. Here it is on the Form 1040, the 100,000. However, there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on that we didn't see with the W-2 income. What's all this other stuff that's happening here? Well, one is that if I go to the Schedule C, then we've got the 100,000 and we've got the Schedule SE, which is the self-employment tax. Now, this is one of the big ones that we have to keep in mind here, calculating the self-employment tax, which is actually higher than what it would have been on the W-2 income because we're, we're calculating both the employer and employee tax in essence. So that comes out to 14,129, which is huge. But again, it's hard to compare that to the W-2 income because the W-2 income, we paid the tax, but it was already paid with withholdings and therefore isn't part of the tax calculation on the 1040 because it was taken care of in the payroll taxes. So then we're going to have to go, okay, that goes into the additional taxes, Schedule 2, other taxes. There's the 14,129, which goes into the Form 1040, page number 2. There's the 14,129. Not only that, but if I go back to the Schedule SE, we get half of that, 7065 which is deductible on the first page of the Form 1040, which is in essence similar to something being deductible for federal income taxes, but not for Social Security and Medicare. That's why it can't be on the Schedule C, even though it's related to the business. So it goes into the Schedule 1, Additional Income and Adjustments to Income, page number 2, Adjustments to Income, line number 15, deductible part of the self-employment tax from the Schedule SE, then to the Form 1040. So now we see the 100,000 minus the 7,065, adjusted gross income 92,935. The standard deduction is still at the 13,850. And then we've got this qualified business income deduction, which is kind of a mess that comes in from form 8995, which is another huge piece that you might get a benefit for on the Schedule C, unlikely to get a benefit for that on the Schedule E, that, that big deduction. So that's at 15, uh, 817 and then finally we get to the taxable income of 63,268. So even though we have the same 100,000 of income, we're basically getting down here to the taxable income of 60 something instead of 86, 63 instead of 86,150. Page two then calculating the federal income tax, 9,288. So 9,000, I'll just put it next to it, 9,000. 9228 and then uh, we also had the the uh, other taxes which is 14129 14129 let's put that here 141229 for a total tax of the 23357 so so you're going to say okay well wait a sec that's a lot more than what it was before Right, so what it was before was this 14,266. But remember that in that 14,266 was Social Security and Medicare, which was the 100,000 times 0 0.062, and then the 100,000 uh, times 0 0.0145 for Social Security and Medicare, which were already paid by withholdings of. Uh, seven thousand, right? So, 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 so this difference, you, you have to take into account that you paid seven thousand six fifty already in the W two income, right? So seven thousand six fifty, and so uh, we had really it would be what we paid was this plus this, which is twenty one. So that's kind of more like a fair compare, like a little bit more of a fair comparison. Those are some of the pros and cons between the Schedule C and uh, the Schedule E uh, um, and, the, <laughs> and the W-2. Now let's say, okay, well, what if, it, what if we had just all of the income in 
a schedule, a normal kind of schedule E, which we're imagining is a separate property that we have uh, that is like our second home that we're using as rental property instead of a second home. And that's going to be the idea. Okay. So then we're going to go back on over and say, all right, let's say that we get rid of this, uh, get rid of this one. And now we've got the schedule E. So we've got income on the schedule E. So now we've got our property. Now we'll get into some of these questions. Did you materially participate in some of these passive activity rules and whatnot in future presentations? But for now, we just want to give a general look at some of the differences if we had like a similar amount of income. So let's say it was 120,000 here and then we had advertising of 20,000. So that's gonna be our, our uh, net is gonna be 100,000 again. So if we just did that, let's go to our forms. And now let's look at our schedule E. So we've got a schedule E instead of a schedule C and I should put the property name and all that stuff up top. But the bottom line is that we have the rent received the 120,000 the advertising is 20,000 that's going to give us a net of the 100,000 again that 100,000 flowing into the schedule one additional income and adjustments to income this time line five rental real estate royalties from the schedule e that then is flowing into the form 1040 there's the 100,000 and it looks very similar to what we had with the W-2 income uh, in, that, in that then we just simply have the standard deduction getting us to the 86,150, 86,150, same amount we had here. And then page number two, we'd have the 14,266, same calculation uh, for the tax. So in other words, we, don't ha we didn't have all this other business of the, that we saw on the Schedule C of one, the self-employment tax on it in part because we might be thinking of it as pass more for passive income whereas the social security and medicare is typically going to be on active income either through withholdings on the w-2 or related to to uh, income on the schedule c for example as we saw with the comparison which means if we don't have the self-employment we don't have this above the line deduction which is half of the self-employment uh but on the on the downside we don't have the qualified business income deduction from form 8995 uh, as well. So, so notice the schedule E oftentimes is kind of more straightforward uh, in that case for some purposes. Now, remember that's on the income side of things. So, so if you were to compare a schedule C versus a schedule E and you had income, you might say, well, the schedule E is going to be, would be better than the schedule c if you if you are able to choose one or the other because you don't have the self-employment tax uh which you are calculated now the irs would argue well you don't get the self-employment tax but by paying into social security you're going to get a benefit on the benefits but obviously i think most sane people would rather keep their money and pay for their own retirement than pay into social security which is clearly bankrupt and will hit the wall at some point into the future. So unless you're close to retirement, uh, then you might say, well, they're not gonna pull the rug out of me right now. I'm right next to retirement and they're gonna hit the kids. They're gonna hit the youngins, not me. But but if you're not close to retirement, you're probably going, yeah, I'm not, I'd rather, I'd rather depend on my own savings for retirement, or at least that's what I would suggest because the, the social security, you know, they might change drastically at some point. It's gonna have to change drastically at some point. Uh, so so that would be that but if there's losses then the question is which is often the case with a schedule e then you might be limited to the amount of losses and the amount of limitation on the losses will depend on different factors such as whether you uh, materially participate or not so remember whenever we get into the realm of losses that's when that's when we, we end up with complications and that's when the schedule E might have more complications, which we'll talk about in future presentations than the schedule C. Now also note that if you had a second property, then you have a home and maybe you have a second home or your client does or whatever. Then the question is, what do you do with that second property? If it was simply a second home, 
then possibly you still get a benefit from it because because you probably have a mortgage on it possibly and maybe on the schedule a you might still be able to deduct the interest and the taxes related to it uh, in in that case remembering though that the taxes real estate taxes are typically going to be capped or are limited if you're in a high income area like california or new york or something like that because there's a limit on the amount of state taxes and local taxes you can take on the federal income tax return but again you might still have the deduction here if it was a second residence uh it, or possibly if it was just investment property uh you might have you know interest related to it but if it was but you don't get then if it was just like your second residence the deduction for all the stuff the maintenance and whatnot that you do to it whereas if it was on a rental property you can see all kind of like the normal expenses over here that might be deductible advertising cleaning commission insurance management fees repairs and so on and so forth so i just want to point this out because a lot of people a lot of times real estate and housing how you deduct houses becomes complicated because of the weirdness that has happened to the tax code over the years so remember the general rule is this if you have an income tax you don't tax people on gross income it makes sense to tax people on net income in this case the 100,000 not the 120,000 why because if you taxed gross income then the businesses that don't have a lot of expenses would be more beneficial than those that do in other words we don't want to discourage people from going into businesses that have a lot of expenses that they have to incur in order to generate revenue if you have to buy a lot of equipment in order to generate revenue that's okay because we're not going to tax you on the revenue if you earned a million dollars but you only earned after the rental expense of all the equipment that you had to use one hundred thousand dollars we're not going to tax you on a million dollars because you only actually got one hundred thousand dollars after all the expenses that were ordinary and necessary to earn the million dollars so that kind of makes sense otherwise you would end up in situations where people even though they are profitable couldn't pay the tax however we also have situations where if you're a w-2 employee which is most people then it's they're getting all the expenses are assumed to be taken care of by the employer so that's why they don't we don't write off expenses for them because the assumption is the irs wants the simplified scenario the irs wants to say we want all the burden on the employer to report all this stuff and then we can just have them give us the income of the employee and we don't have to worry about all these other deductions stuff so that means for most people we don't really have ordinary and necessary business expense deductions because you're a w-2 employee what we have instead are these things typically what people think of on the schedule a which are weird compared to a normal income tax system because these are not things that you would think natural to an income tax system they are the government trying to nudge us right trying to adjust our behavior with the tax code so things like medical expenses taxes you paid like why would you get to deduct the mortgage interest on your personal residence that's a personal property you didn't use it to generate the revenue it's a personal expense there's multiple reasons they're going to say the argument is that you're trying to get people to afford a home and so on and this so forth uh, but probably a lot of it came because of lobbyists right the the real estate professionals made a lot of money doing doing that and in the end it kind of it's it's inflating the price of homes in other words if they didn't do that most likely the price of homes would be lower it would and it would work itself out in the long in the long run right the price would be lower but we wouldn't get a tax benefit and it would be more simple of a system right so and same so so the taxes you paid same thing gifts to charity you know there obviously the argument is to try to give a tax incentive to give gifts to charity i'm not sure again if that's totally beneficial because it kind of defeats the idea of the gift to the charity you're supposed to be giving so i think people w might actually give more if they were entitled to <laughs> if they were doing it out of you know the the spirit of giving and not you know i think that is that would actually be more beneficial than to say ah yeah i gave to i gave to charity because i got a tax benefit you know that seems kind of like not the proper mindset I, I i almost think but in any case you could see what these are doing 
And the reason I point that out is because the biggest one is for your home, which is your, your house, right? So you start to think, well, of course, mortgage interest is deductible because it's deducted on the Schedule A. Uh, but, but that's weird. That's not normal because normally your personal expenses aren't deducted on the Schedule A. It does make sense to deduct things like mortgage interest if it was a separate property that you're using as rental property because now the property itself isn't personal but rather rental property and you had to get the loan in order to buy the rental property so that you can get so that you can earn the revenue so in that case the financing does make sense so then you would have the interest you still get this form 1098 and you'd be deducting it on the schedule e so again, a lot of people, when they see the form 1098, for example, if you're a tax preparer, or you think schedule A, but of course, if there's rental property, then the question is, was the property their principal residence? Was it their second home? Or is it categorized as rental property? And if it's, and if it's rental property, you'd be deducting it on the schedule E, which actually makes more sense just from a natural concept of an income tax uh, type of situation. Now, the other thing we have to keep in mind with the Schedule E is going to be the depreciation of the property. So remember that uh, unlike, well, with a Schedule C business, then you might have like a separate building that you're reporting on the Schedule C, but many of the things that you'd have to put on the books as an asset of a uh, depreciable asset would be things like equipment and whatnot. And so, so the general idea, remember, for depreciation is, well, if I'm on a cash-based system, I would like to just expense the thing, equipment expense, when I buy it. But the IRS is going to say, even though you're on a cash-based system, you have to do an accrual thing here because the cost of the equipment is so high that we need to put it on the books as an asset and then allocate the cost over its useful life, which, remember, is difficult on a tax return or seems strange because we don't have a full bookkeeping system here we only have in essence the income statement the the if we put it on the books as an asset that's a balance sheet account but we can include the balance sheet asset accounts on a separate schedule which is a depreciation schedule now when you get to the schedule e you're certainly almost definitely going to have some kind of depreciation schedule uh, because unless you're rent sub renting or something like that because the, you're you're now renting the home uh a home or a rental property and the rental property itself is going to be one of the biggest deductions in the form of depreciation so so then the questions of what's going to be the value of the rental property becomes important how do we know what the value is well one it, one we could purchase it when we purchase it, obviously, then we can kind of figure out what the purchase price is, which is a little difficult in and of itself. But then we also have to break out between land and building because the building part is going to be the part that will typically be depreciable. We'll talk more about that in future presentations, but want to point that out here because that's a difference between when we get to deduct things on the Schedule E as opposed to when you deduct things related to property on the Schedule A for say your principal residence. When something is your principal residence, you kind of you might forget what the basis of the property is because you're not tracking it from year to year because you don't get a tax benefit for the depreciation of your property only for the interest on the mortgage for some strange reason because that's just some weird rule that they put in, right? So we're not really depreciating the value of the property over its useful life getting a tax benefit from it if it's our personal residence. If it's for rental property, then of course we do because we're consuming the property like we would equipment over its useful life is the concept and therefore should get a deduction related to it, not on a cash-based system, not when we purchase the property, but as we consume the property, not depreciating land, however, given the concept that land doesn't go down uh, in value is going to be uh, the general idea there. Okay, so we'll dive into depreciation a little bit more in future presentations. The other things about depreciation is what if you converted something from a personal property to a rental property? Well, then we have a question of what is the basis because now we didn't just purchase it. Is it the basis that we had before 
or is it the fair market value? And how do we determine the fair market value when we're talking about real estate, which is a unique thing, unlike trading stocks and whatnot? Or what if we inherited the property or were gifted the property? How would we figure out what the basis is if we convert it from personal to, you know, to, to the rental property? So we'll, talk, we'll touch on those ideas, which once we have the property on the books, hopefully if it's on the books correctly, isn't a problem afterwards, but when we first put the property on the books, it becomes an issue. We also have an interplay between the basis or cost of the property uh, and the depreciation, meaning the potential tax benefit goes down as we record depreciation as the book value goes down, which could result in rental income when we went or capital gain income when we sell the property. So that's another thing to just keep in mind a difference between like a Schedule A property, your principal residence, where we get a benefit of the expense, but it's not reducing the value or basis of the property. Therefore, when I sell it, I'm going to have less of a gain or more of a loss when I sell it. Also, when I sell my principal residence, if it is a principal residence, I usually have this huge exclusion resulting in even if I had a big gain, that I don't have to have a tax consequence on the federal income t side, hopefully, is the general idea. Whereas if it was classified as a Schedule E rental property, then the basis will be lower, most likely resulting in a higher capital gain. And you don't have the exemption if it was your personal property, if it was a rental property, therefore you might have a tax consequence, a, you know, a substantial tax consequence for selling the rental property as opposed to the personal property, which leads to tax planning strategies such as, well, what if I moved into the rental property, lived in it until it qualified for my principal residence and then sold it, possibly allowing me to get the exemption, or could I sell it in some form of 1031 exchange? So those are just some other things to kind of keep in mind, differences between the rental property and the personal property as we go through our discussions. The other thing that's a big one, of course, will be the fact that if you're talking about rental property, you might have a second home that you simply rent and it's completely rental property, but you might have a personal component as well. For example, you might have your principal residence renting a part of your principal residence, which leads to confusion because now you might have a situation where part of say the mortgage interest and the real estate taxes should be deducted here in the schedule E and maybe part of it should be deducted here on the schedule A. And then you might have a situation where part of the depreciation of the property because it's rental property maybe should be depreciated, lowering the value of uh, or the, the, the basis of the property, but getting an expense for it. And then when you sell the property, it's a little bit more complicated because now do I get the exemption? given for the full property, given the fact that I use part of the property for <laughs> rental use and so on. And, and so that becomes kind of an issue and we might get into that a little bit later. And then the other way would be if I had a vacation home and I use it for part of the year, again, now you're mixing business and personal. And the question would then be, to what, what am I gonna do with the expenses related to those items? Now note in, in those situations, for example, the income is what it is. If I got 120,000 of income, it's not like any of that was personally related because the income was only received for the rental part of the property. So the income is usually pretty straightforward. Normally you have to record the income if you rented the property, unless you were under like 15 days or something of your personal residence that you rented part of it out or something like that. Otherwise, income would typically be fairly straightforward. It's the expenses that become a problem because many of these expenses are for the full property, like the mortgage interest isn't for, uh, isn't for just my or the rental part, it's for the full property. So then you end up with these allocation things that you have to do and say, well, I need to allocate the amount of the expenses that are going to the, the renting of the property versus the personal use of the property. The personal use of the property would not generally be deductible on the on the schedule e right because it would be a vacation home unless it, unless you can call it a second residence or something like that but but uh and then and like a repairs for example wouldn't be you can't deduct the whole thing because the repairs of the roof 
was for both personal and business. What's the ratio that I would get a deduction for? I only get a deduction for the business part. I don't get a deduction, in this case, the rental. I don't get a deduction for the personal part because it was personal and you don't usually get a deduction for personal stuff except for the weird stuff that's on the Schedule A like the mortgage interest for some strange reason. So those are some of the topics we'll dive into more in future presentations.